Bruce Broussard. Welcome to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, as you know, we're, we're getting really, really close to making sure that we're going to have uh, our own campaigns here in the state of Oregon. The 8th of March is the last day for filing to run for office. And the definition of running for office is that that's going to be basically our spokespersons, our leadership aspect of it. You got to remember that, uh, because in all due respect, if in fact we're going to we're going to talk about the issues of Oregon, there are two options that you have in order to be able to respond to it. Uh, once the election is over and you get your ballots in the mail, it's your vote. That's one option, the vote. The other is to run for office. Therefore, you got two hats. You can respond to the vote. And, you, and at the same time, you can actually identify the issue that you feel that's, uh, that's basically, uh, let's say, a major, of, a major concern here within the state of Oregon. So it's very important for those of you who have not filed or yet to run for office, again, that's on the 9th of this month, 9th of March, which is a Tuesday. At 5 o'clock, it closes. So if you're interested, go down there and file, okay? Very, very important. Eight. But, Eighth is the eighth? eighth? Is the eighth? That's a Tuesday, right? Yes, the eighth. I'm sorry, Father. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. As you can see, I, I've got two attentive uh, uh, <laughs> officials. Uh, not, well, let's see, t serious Oregonians. Let's put it that way. I don't want to call them politicians because yeah. that's the thing that we are all, all, all of us in Oregon are running away from. That's a that's a major major problem. We really have to get to the issues, folks. Very very serious times. We're not going to spend too much time on the on the national election. I mean, that's a whole different ball game. Again, they, they're doing their thing, but we're talking about Oregon, right here in Oregon, and that's what we're going to be doing to, to this this particular hour. I've got two candidates here that uh, one who be, will be running for governor for the state of Oregon, and that's in Bruce Cuff. You've seen Bruce before. He's on he's on my far left over here. You can see Bruce over there on that end of it. I've got one of his decals here. It says "Enough time for Cuff, Governor." Time for a cuff governor, right? That's yep, where you go to. Yep. And then Art Ryman, you've seen Art before. Art's been on the show a number of times. At one point in time, we met uh, some time ago. He was chair of the state Republican Party at one point in time. And, uh, in fact, that's how I got introduced to him, and that's how I got involved. I was the engagement chair for the for his administration and, and then also the veteran outreach coordinator. And I've since stick around. I'm sticking around, and I'm still the, the engagement chair for the Oregon Republican Party and the and the Veterans uh, Outreach Program, which is really good. We can talk a little bit more about that. And uh, then the other candidate that's going to well, Art is running for the U.S. Senate. No, I'm not sorry, House. Congress, the House. Gee whiz, I'm really getting. I'm so excited about this piece with these two guys. But anyway, he's running for the U.S. House against DeFazio. You remember De DeFazio? Uh, DeFazio is already in. He's he's been the incumbent. He's been in been in, been in that seat for how long, Mark? At this time, almost thirty years. Almost thirty years. 30 years, you know, again, another problem, if you will. But anyway, we've got Art here. Art's going to be running again, and uh, I think that hopefully we're going <laughs> to we'll see some results on this time around, okay? Good. So let's begin. Let's first, let's first maybe begin. As you can see, I've got a new garb now. That's This is my standard uh, door-knocking uh, uh, uniform that I'll be out there knocking on doors, and that'll be right after the 8th because I will be filing on the last day the last day. My rationale for doing that, I want to know who's going to be running for mayor of the city of Portman. Mm -hmm. I want to, I don't want any surprises. I will be, I'll be filing at 459. <laughs> 459 at City Hall. Uh, but I'll be there. I'll be there right there with a group, if you will. But anyway, I'm going to be running for, for the city of Portland, and you'll be hearing a little bit more of, of me. In fact, the next show, I'm going to really get down to the issues. But this time around, I've got these two guys here that are going to basically talk to those, uh, to their particular issues. And the other reason why I'm doing this is that I was involved in a sort of a, it, w it wasn't a protest, it was it's really a, an informational education kind of a situation. It's a very serious concern for the state of Oregon. And I've been following that here at Oregon Voters Digest. I'm talking about BLM. I can say BLM, Bureau of Land Management. What does that mean? And for, and for the last two or three shows, I've had the pleasure of, interviewing Bruce Cuff, who lives in that particular area, in the Burns area, and the, the no, like. Well, but you live in Oregon. Yes, I am. Okay, and you are familiar with Burns. Yes, I am. And you've been very active in the Burns. Yes, I've and been. And you, the, you were, you were in, the, in the parade yesterday, in the protest yes, yesterday. Yes, we were. And you spoke at the parade yesterday. We, so, I did. So, what was it, so what's your answer again now? You live in that area? I, yeah, I, I live with those, with those rallies. Okay, good. Supporters. That sounds right. good. But anyway, we've got a lot of information from, from, uh, from Bruce. He really helped us out, especially in this area. 
you know, we're not from that particular area, and we got a better feel. And I will say for you that it really was a, it was a very, it was a good, um, it was a good uh, act, active kind of a program, if you will, or with the people aspect of it. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. It was right here in Portland, right downtown Portland. Yep. A very good group, a very articulate group, Oregonians, patriots, uh, you know, U.S. citizen, the whole nine yard. And I thought that was a very great piece. Portland police were there, and uh, there was no problems. They really responded to all of the issues that were there. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really great. There were two groups on both sides. There was the group that you were with, and there was the other group. And in, and what I learned from that aspect of it, uh, they just needed the education. They, they just wasn't educated about what was really going on. Mm -hmm. Most of them were looking at it from the standpoint of the Second Amendment, which were guns and whatever, but that really wasn't the issue. And then the idea of just taking uh, and then identifying this group as a very activist group. I took the opportunity in this uniform right here where, that I have right now with my jacket on and my hat, and I went on both sides out. I went on one side and I asked them what the problem was, and they basically didn't have the background. It was about BLM. That's that's what they want to talk about, and they, they just needed being educated. And I went on the other side, and there was another incident with the with the group that Bruce was with, is uh, that um, besides the BLM aspect of it, uh, there, there was this this other issue that a, that a, that a gentleman. Well, uh, well, a gentleman died. He got killed. He got shot, mm -hmm. and th that was a very serious situation. That should never have happened. No, that should happen. never, never, never have happened. Aspect of it. No. So, so anyway, uh, I better just go on and get these guys. Give them an opportunity to chat for a minute. So, why don't we just, for, for, if you don't mind, Bruce, why don't you bring us up just update wise, in terms of what happened yesterday, and because uh, you were in Portland, yep. in 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 our city. Yep. Well, being the mayor, I wanted to make sure that I it's wanted to see city. what was going on. That's right. right. It's our city. It's your city. As I indicated, when you, when you guys gave me the opportunity to speak at that particular rally, uh, I said to them at that point in time that we, we are really, the, Portland, Oregon is really the, the welcoming format mm -hmm. for the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. People come here first, aspect of it. And so it's very, very important that we know what's going on. Right. Okay, good. Absolutely. So why don't you just maybe spend a couple of minutes and let us know about that piece, and then we'll get into the other part of it. Well, the purpose of the rally yesterday was basically to bring attention to um, what's going on uh, up to this point. And, and the main function was to honor Lavoie Finnicum. He was the one that was killed uh, uh, in, the, in the ambush out there. Uh, you know, it, it was called a normal police stop, you know, uh, but it was not. It was, it was set up... Uh, to, to basically trap these guys there. So Lavoie was killed in that, and um, the Bundys and those that were with him are, have been imprisoned, and they're treating these guys like terrorists when, in fact, they're not, they're not terrorists. They, they were exercising their Second Amendment rights out there, but, you know, the, the most they should have been charged with is, is you trust, say second trespass. amendment a lot of times people just don't know what that is well they, talking about the constitution yeah what, the what second amendment they, they carried they carried weapons you know they, Which they is were legal? armed oh sure they okay. i mean they're perfectly you know the uh, our, our founding father said uh madison they made the statement that the reason the federal government will never encroach upon the rights of the individual citizens is because they are all armed they have a second amendment right and, and we view those rights as being inalienable rights that are given to us by God. Mm -hmm. And so they're, only, they're, they're merely listed in our Constitution, but these rights are ours from, from God himself. So, and and that's, that's clear from our Declaration of Independence. We've stated that, that you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. You know? So um, anyway, so what went on is... is this was not just here in Portland and Salem. This was a nationwide rally. It there was, was for that the, day. For that day, and there were rallies all over the country. I think the last I heard that it was at least thirty-seven states. There might have been more wow. by the time that we got done. But but it was it was. Uh, but how many in Oregon? We well we had uh, the ones that I know about. Uh, there was there was a rally in Bend. There was a rally in Portland. There was a rally in Salem. Those are the three I know about. I'm sure there were other smaller ones that that I did not know about. The two that I was involved with uh, was the one in Portland and the one in Salem. Okay. And the folks approached me right away when they were planning it and asked me if I was if I would be willing to speak. And I said absolutely. Just tell me where I need to be and where. where. Right. Um, and and you know of course uh, Bundy, Am Ammon Bundy and his brother Ryan, they're both in prison right now, and they will not let them out on bail. 
Um, you know, these guys get called in before the judge and they're in shackles and, uh, you know, they're treating them like terrorists and they are not. And um, they should be able to go back to their families. And even this week, they rounded up another, I think it was 12 or 14 of these guys that were involved in the Bundy standoff in 2014 and also some more from the refuge. So they're just systematically picking these guys off. David Bundy, for instance, I heard the only thing that he did at the Bundy Ranch was take pictures. He did not, he was not armed, he didn't take do it. Take pictures of what? Just taking pictures of the law enforcement officers and what was going on there. Mm -hmm. he, he was not involved in that at all, but yet he, he was one of them that they just arrested. And he's got six children. And uh, so, you know, um, the federal government is systematically attacking folks, I believe, for their political beliefs. Mm -hmm. You know, that they believe that the federal government has overstepped its bounds when it comes to um, D the BLM, the, the Bureau of Land Management, and, and abusing ranchers all across this nation. These ranchers have grazing rights, water rights, uh, property rights that that uh, the new legislation and statutes that they pass, they don't they don't mm -hmm. get rid of those. They those continue on. In fact, the the statutes themselves state that uh, these statutes do not change these rights that already exist. So, uh, and a lot of people out there think that you know these guys are paying these grazing fees, and this is somehow a leaseholder. I'm a real estate agent, so. You know, this is like I'm renting this land and the government can decide that, hey, I don't want you on my land anymore. I'm not going to charge your rent. You're off. No, no. These guys have these grazing rights are the rights to that grass on that land. And it's and it's, you know, I used to use the, the term public land, but the legal definition of public land is land that is free of encumbrances, which people can homestead on. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we have. We don't have public land. We have what I believe we have in Oregon, we got 53% of the of our state that is state land that is unconstitutionally being managed by the federal government and they need to turn loose of it. Mm -hmm. So the land that we have that is, um, that you could refer to as public land, we should re really be referring to it as state land that has never been actually deeded over to the state and, and have the federal government out of the way. Well, so, you know, I know we get, we've, been, we've been doing some of this, uh, but long, how long has this been going on? I mean, how long have we been discussing this issue? Well, the, this, how long? this particular issue, it, 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 it's kind of like one of those things that, that, that uh, flames up and then dies down okay. because as, as the BLM abuses folks more and more, and it's kind of like the frog in, in the pot of water. You know, if you throw the frog in the hot pot of water, he'll jump right out. Well, the frog in the cold water, you turn, that, you turn the heat up on him, and he just sits there and cooks. Mm -hmm. Gets to a point where the BLM, they turn up the heat too quickly, abusing these farmers, and they'll jump out of the pot. So then they turn the heat back down. Okay, but, so it goes up and down, you know, year right, to year. Right, right. But, um, but what, you, what I'm, what but I'm it hearing... it goes back to the 1880s. Okay, so I'm, yeah. what I'm hearing, we need to resolve it. we got to resolve it. We need to resolve it. We need because to. Because we don't need any... As far as I'm concerned, people don't need to be shot anymore. I mean, no. That's, that's ridiculous. Absolutely not. not. Not among ourselves. I mean, and, and the other thing is that I've learned one thing again, too, is that when one says federal government, no, it's us. Yeah. It's a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. We need to bring that back to the table to make sure that that's there. And then I've heard something else, with Reverend. I'm gonna, in fact, I want to bring Art in on this piece. We talked a little bit about that, and that is the the, the Constitution. Mm -hmm. What does that document mean, and what? And let's educate the public about what it is. Art, you might we might we'll get give Art come up to what is the Constitution, and what does those amendments mean, to Art, and well, how we, do they derive? The Constitutional Republic. We live in a constitutional republic, right. not a democracy, a okay. republic, and it's the rules of our republic. Uh, laid down by our founders and amended from time to time. There are procedures mm -hmm. to amend it and change it. So the uh, the Constitution is the entirety of the rules under which the federal government operates. Mm -hmm. It delegates a very large amount of the authority to the states. Mm -hmm. uh, and if and and the people in office are just supposed to be stewards of our rights and principles in government, mm -hmm. and they must they're sworn to follow the Constitution. An awful lot of the problems we have in our state, in our country today result from politicians and bureaucrats who do not follow the Constitution, even though they have sworn to us to do so. So uh, every American should, it's a very simple document. The founders wrote it so we could all understand it. And we are a constitutional republic. Those are the 
rules and the only rules under which our federal government mm -hmm. operates. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a very, it is, it is the reason that we have had liberty and prosperity and built the greatest nation in the world mm -hmm. because it was the best way that has ever been devised for men when and women and this is law to this is law well that that all of our laws are derived from it all oh, from here that's right there now are these are these uh, laws uh, taught in our schools i mean i can remember <laughs> i can remember reading yeah. about this piece back when but what about today well more and more today the the young people are not taught this at all and that's that's very bad and the uh uh, we have, you see, the politicians, we think we're electing powerful people to decide what we'll do, right. and that's not the way it's supposed to be. During the first hundred years of our country, a member of the House of Representatives in Washington usually served only one term. He was simply a citizen volunteer. Mm -hmm. His, the local people thought he could be entrusted with that, that job for a mm -hmm. couple of years and was a little honored to do it, so they did it. Today it's an entirely different thing. We have politicians and bureaucrats who get into power for 10, 20, 30 years, they forget the Constitution. They mm -hmm. decide that they're running the country and the rules don't matter. And then those issues are constantly changing, yeah. too, mm -hmm. but and never get the uh, when, when he talks about the rights these farmers have, they are derived from the Constitution mm -hmm. and from contract law, mm -hmm. the contracts that the, the stewards of our federal government have made with the people. And, of course, they have to honor those contracts. Mm -hmm. And all over Oregon, we see that they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, the ONC lands in southern Oregon have destroyed our the failure of the government to honor its contracts have destroyed an entire industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So following the Constitution works. When you depart from it, you start to get tyranny. Mm -hmm. And I'm not telling you our whole no, government yeah, right, is tyranny, right. but right. when men are given power that mm -hmm. is unrestrained by a set of rules mm -hmm. that the people have agreed to, then you have trouble, mm. and we need to return to constitutional principles. Mm -hmm. Now, Bruce, where do we go from here? We, we, you've had the, you've had the, the demonstration. You, you basically tried to communicate, if you will. We mm -hmm. were communicating to the public at large right. to try to educate them as to what transpired. Right? You got right. The, now we've got folks that are incarcerated, waiting for trial. I take it, waiting for trial. Mm -hmm. That process is going to have to go through that whole process. One, are you, uh, are, are, are the group still involved with, with that part of the process? Yes. They are. In fact, um, the the groups that were there, I mean, they they are monitoring the situation. Every time one of these guys comes before a judge, they want to have court observers present to take notes to keep track of what's going on, so that so that their due process rights are not abused. And um, so there's a number of folks out there that that are recruiting people to to be because there's a lot of these guys being called in front of of the court system and you know th they just need people to basically go sit in on these hearings and take notes of what what's going on so that so that they can document the fact that that in fact their due process rights are being violated and so they so they've got documentation of that from from just watching how the court operates with these guys and just to, for instance um, when these guys come into court many of them are shackled hand and feet and they just shuffle in there and they've got chains on them like they're terrorists or something and you know then they explain to them that you know they're innocent until proven guilty well you look and they go like this down look at their chains and they look at the judge and they say yeah it, i'm really <laughs> feeling innocent here until proven guilty and the fact of the matter is the the trials even coming to trial is drugged on to the fact to the point where it's ridiculous. These guys have been incarcerated. They're not allowing them to get out on bail. I mean, they're not dangerous. Ammon Bundy is not a dangerous person. Well, aren't they being represented? I mean, yes, they I've are. I've heard but, of a prosecutor, yeah, they, and I've heard about a defendant. Do they have representation? Well, they do have representation, but, What's the deal? but the judge in this case is is absolutely, um, you know, I don't know what, what dog she's got in the fight, but a lot of these guys that are involved from the judicial point of view there's there's there could be some conflict of interest things where they should recuse themselves from these cases and let somebody else do it because there's an agenda i mean there is an it just appears that there is an agenda and uh and even the press is complicit in this you know i mean just yesterday when we had our press conference you know we we had people and they asked us to tell us tell who we are and i said look i'm i'm bruce cuff i'm a i'm a 
Christian constitutional conservative Republican candidate for governor, and then we talked. Did they think that made it on the news? No, they said I was a Lavoie supporter, and you know, just just totally. What was the guy that, that, that got shot? I mean, yeah. Lavoie, yeah, yes. yeah, and, and that's what the symbol is. That's okay. his name, and this okay. is one of the symbols of of the group. It, uh, it, the way that they're protesting, um, uh, what happened? So, but yeah, right right now we're just we're just trying to get these guys out on bail so they can go back to their families. Okay. I mean, we're they, just trying they, to draw attention to that. As far as representation, was that court appointed? Or they, or they, they some of them own? do have court appointed. Some of them have hired attorneys. So I mean, it varies. There's so many of them in prison. It, it's kind of hard to you know explain who's got what, but. They do have some fund me go, you know, the the fund me accounts and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, to, to help get money for their okay. for their camp for to. So the next step defending. right now is just basically monitoring the, that whole process. Yeah, making right? sure okay. that they've got okay. due process and 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 they're the people that are uh, that were out there at the refuge. Anybody that or eyewitness testimony, they're trying to make sure that they can testify when need be for on their behalf so mm -hmm. okay all right then that sounds good okay well we got that up that update now let's get get into the election aspect of it because now we need to talk about the representation that you guys are basically trying to pursue okay mm -hmm. okay from a from the governor's standpoint um, what what are you if, if I were to ask you what would be the top two issues that you will be basically talking to and and educating the the voting public as to why they should select you as governor of, of the of the of the of Oregon. Well, the I mean we we've already talked about I think what the one of the number one issues is and that is 53 percent of the state of Oregon is currently being managed by the federal government and it's state land that should be managed by our counties, and that the revenue from the management of that grazing fees and whatnot should be going into our counties to provide services and schools and whatnot. Because our Are these counties throughout the state, or 36 is it just counties, counties, yeah, 36 counties, like the one for instance, Harney County, uh, 53 percent of the state of Oregon. I think Harney County, something like 80 percent of it is is actually federal managed land. So mm -hmm. they are overwhelmingly, and that county is just dying on the vine because mm -hmm. it does not have the revenue it needs for police support and and schools and whatnot. So. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely, you know, there was a time in the 80s where there was over 700 jobs there in the timber industry. Today they have six. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all of these kind of things play into to the detriment of, of our rural communities. And, and, it, and, that's a, and this is a Portland issue. This is a, that's this what is, I was going to say. The this is an urban issue we because, you know, we've we, we got to take care of all Oregonians. We can't mm -hmm. just look after ourselves. So this is just not a one-sided no, issue. No, it isn't. All 36 if, counties. If you, if you want to enjoy, if you want to be able to go out as a Portlander and go out there and enjoy these communities, you're not going to be able to do that because you're going to have ghost towns. And you're going to have people that are, you know, can't afford to keep businesses going. And you're, so when you go out there, do you want to really want to go out there where it's just desolate? Or do you want to have a thriving community that's actually, you know, a, a good place to go and, 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 be, and hang out with the local people? I mean, okay. so it is, a, it is a, an issue that all Portlanders should be, be thinking about. Okay. Let's bring Art in on this deal because, in all due respect, let's say you, you're the governor aspect of it. You, you basically then bring in the congressional delegation. Mm -hmm. Okay, someone like Art will, will be running for for uh, for con Congress, uh, and the whole idea is that he's got to go back to back to the administration mm -hmm. and and put it on the table, right? Yep. To deal with this issue, what do you think, Art? What, well, what's some uh, of your response? Turn on your How television you state today. Just turn on his television set at random today and watch the Republican primaries. Mm -hmm. That shows you what the people think of the quality of management in Washington. There's not a Republican candidate left. It is an outsider running against the establishment. Mm -hmm. uh, the Republican base, uh, the grassroots Republicans throughout the country are just fed up. Mm -hmm. And this uh, affects all sorts of things, education, uh, business, taxes, regulations, uh, the giant bureaucracy that's controlling our lives, and of course feeds out the, the BLM as a, mm -hmm. one of those bureaucracies. And the, the people are, uh, are really fed up mm -hmm. and you can't get that we've had some pr prominent people with many abilities in the Republican Party if they're perceived as part of the Washington establishment those guys got so few votes they're gone already mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, you, you can pick many things you were talking about prosperity in uh, previous elections I've walked 
main streets throughout Oregon District 4. Mm -hmm. And I've always won in the four counties that are most rural and outside of Eugene and Corvallis, won four straight elections against DeFazio. But the difference is that in Eugene and Corvallis, the universities bring vast amounts of money into those communities. A lot, large of it, a lot of it is one way or another tax money, and then there's mm -hmm. other money. So the universities bring huge amounts of money in the communities, that sloshes around, and the mm -hmm. merchants are prosperous. Go down Main Street, Eugene, Corvallis, the merchants are happy. They're able to, they're, they're suffering under too much regulation and taxation, but they're also in a very, a place where there's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. As soon as you go close south of Eugene, it's horrible. Uh, a typical Main Street in District 4 has uh, one-third, as maybe as one-half of the mm -hmm. buildings is empty. Mm -hmm. uh, the merchants that are there, largely it's one merchant in his shop. He can't afford to apply an order of, uh, have an a, a employee. Uh, the, uh, uh, the economics <coughs> are horrible. So you see what's happening. Politically, uh, the incumbent congressman cannot win in those districts because Washington has already hurt them so much that they're losing their way of life. Mm -hmm. when, but the district also includes a couple of counties where an unusual situation, two universities, brings in so much money that they have been shielded, but it's coming to them. You know, mm -hmm. the news just talked about layoffs at U of O. It's mm -hmm. going to start. And the, you just can't take a free enterprise economy functioning as a constitutional republic and turn it into something that is controlled by a vast bureaucracy and a lot of unprincipled pol career politicians and not cause great amounts mm -hmm, of damage. Mm -hmm. So much damage has been done by Washington already that, as I said, the, the entire Republican Party is just revolting. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you can't get any traction in these presidential races mm -hmm. unless you're seen as an outsider ready to tear Washington mm -hmm. apart. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a remarkable phenomenon, but it's been coming for a long time. Mm -hmm. And you can see its effects in District mm -hmm. 4, as I've just outlined. You know, and folks, I want, to, I want you to know the reason why I'm doing this with these two gentlemen right here and, 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 and talking to, i.e., a governor, potentially a governor, a, a gubernatorial person, and a congressional person, is the fact of the matter is, is that that's the team that we're going to have to rely on to resolve this issue. And too often what happens is that people play off with the R side, the R brand and the D brand, mm -hmm. Republican and the Democratic yeah. brand. But in all due respect, once they're elected, they are nonpartisan. That's right. <laughs> they represent all the people. You, bet. you got my point? And, and so a lot of times the folks who are not doing something will use that as an excuse of saying, do not vote for the brand, if you will. Yeah. And, that's, and that's the thing we've got to change. And that's why the people are so upset about it right now. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, we're not going to change it at all. There's got to be a beneficiary. I always say, follow the money. Okay. Follow the money. There's always a beneficiary. So it's very important that you understand that. These folks are really running as a nonpartisan entity. They just happen to brand. You know, you're a Republican brand, but you're talking about the issues. Right. And then the idea is naturally you've got to talk about the solutions. Yeah. You know, you've got to make sure that if you understand this issue, then what are we going to do? What's, how are you going to go about fixing it, right, or, right. or representing yourself? You can only fix it because it's about the numbers, too. Because once you go to D.C., everybody, everybody there is fighting for their own issues in their respective areas. Fair? Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. All right, anything, anything yes, else? it's it's clear, and the the uh, distinction between the parties is blurring too, yes. because uh, both parties are responsible for this, not just one, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the people realize it. Mm -hmm. The revolt in the Republican Party is a revolt against both parties, mm -hmm. and the Democrat Party is uh, having its problems too. Yes, it's these parties have been very useful, mm -hmm. and of course, it's difficult to be elected if you're not a D or an R, because right. so many people are loyal exactly. to one or the <laughs> other. Our problem is not party specific. Okay. We it's, will uh, we will get it resolved one way or the other. The people will resolve it. Oh, oh very the much. So. That's, will, that's what I'm will saying. Will resolve and they need to look at this thing just that way. <laughs> yeah. But we're frustrated. But, but it still is the greatest country in the world. It is. You know, right Absolutely. Of, you want to keep it that way. Exactly. That's right. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll just come back and uh, and we'll continue this discussion. They, I'm sure they got more to say, and, and we want them to say more. But we also want them to talk about solutions. Okay. We'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
All right, folks, we're back. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard here. I'm standing in, I guess, for Bruce here at the Oregon Voters Digest. By the way, don't forget us here. we got Facebook here. Here we go. You can, you can tune in on this piece because on YouTube, uh, or you can just go to Facebook and we can give you some. This, this particular interview will be on Facebook. Just check it out. Oregon Voters Digest. Oregon Voters Digest on Facebook. And you'll see my smiling face aspect of it on that piece. Well, hey, as you can see, we have been discussing, if you will, an issue uh, that is, uh, let's put it this way, it's, it's, it's been well publicized, the whole issue here in Southern Oregon and um, on, on the whole issue of Bundy and the, the, but anyway, the Burns and whatever, but the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, one, once for, as far as I'm concerned, one, we need to educate our population about what that's all about. And then the other one is that and these, these, these handbooks are handed out, but in all due respect, we need to know what the Constitution is. We got guidelines in terms of why we exist today. This is the glue of this yeah. country. This is the glue, the guidelines. And like uh, like Art had made mention about the fact that we got, well, we just got folks thinking in the wrong way. And all due respect, we got too many lawyers sitting up there in, in Congress mm -hmm. right now. I mean, uh, because they are the ones of the Bibles, they are the dictionary, mm -hmm. and we're just sitting back there. But they, in all due respect, they're supposed to be doing that to get a do a job done. They're supposed to have issues. As, as it relates to their respective areas that they've run from, mm -hmm. that will better our way of life. Mm -hmm. And they just need to be told this now. They, people need to get it. We need to talk about term limits and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Because after they've done that issue, they're supposed to bring that home, right? And hopefully there's a resolution of some sort. And then the next time around, they got to come up with some other solution issue, and then we vote accordingly. But anyway, that's, that, that's part of it. But let's get now into some of the other issues that uh, I think there's a major issue that's that's relative to this whole area of state is education, mm -hmm. our education system. And as you know, and I'm going to just throw this out on the table, and we would, we'll just have that discussion. We, we used to have a, an excellent public education some time, some time ago when, I, when we were going there at this mm -hmm. time. But then we went through all of these different changes and, uh, and why we did that. And I'm going to let you guys kind of give us a better feel of that piece. We went from the public school system to all of a sudden we went through, uh, we, we, all of a sudden people saying, well, gee, we get very upset about this because my kids are not getting it getting an education, they don't know what's going on, and what do I do, and et cetera, et cetera. Then we went through homeschool, and then we went through charter school. I mean, we got all these different systems to try to figure out what to do about mm -hmm. our futures, mm -hmm. and it's frustrating. Okay. People are very upset about this piece. Why don't we start off with you, Art? Uh, uh, what about Let's you? Let's start with the, the governor. governor. Yeah, we yeah. start with the governor. Let's start you're gonna with be the giving governor. Him the, you're going to be giving him the orders to get down there and say, I got some problems here. <laughs> okay. Go on, go on, governor. Well, uh, you know, it, it's an issue of fairness right now because... Excuse me, that's Bruce Cuff, too, by the way. I want you to know. That's Bruce Cuff. Enough is enough. It's time for Bruce Cuff. There you that's go. Okay, oh, okay, Governor Cuff. What's, well, what's going on here? You know, it, it's an issue of fairness because in Oregon, we, we have said that, uh, you know, as a, as a state, we, we support public education, and, and the tax money goes to pay for that. And But currently right now, in the school system, in the public school system, it's be, it's becoming increasingly... Uh, anti-Judeo-Christian values. It, it, it's attacking the Common Core and whatnot. It, it, parents that want to teach their kill, have their kids dis, have their kids disciplined, and and parents that want to actually teach their kid, their children uh, Judeo-Christian values. It's becoming more and more hard to do that. And even from a teacher's point of view, we're losing a lot of good teachers because there is just a lot of diversity stuff out there that's anti-Christian, anti, you know, anti-family stuff. And so um, if a parent wants to uh, have control of their children's education, they're basically paying twice because they're, they're having to pay a tuition for a private school. And so as governor, what I would like to see is, okay, it, because the public system does not function, it's not going to function properly uh, it, if the agenda keeps being pushed from the feds. Because, you know, there is no nothing in our Constitution that gives the federal government the right to do anything with education. If you read that whole document, you're not going to find education, that they have any right to do anything with education. But what do we have? We have Common Core right now in our schools that that is uh the most common core what do you mean it's it's well it's a whole system of educating the kids uh, you know about a, what math science okay, social studies what about studies? reading writing and arithmetic yeah, just basic it, but, stuff yeah but 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 it but it's it, it it's the way i've had it described to me it is it's, it's like dumbing down our kids you know uh it, it's not it's not uh 
it's not based on on um, just solid basic you know reading writing arithmetic like we we learned in school all of a sudden I mean there's an agenda there's an agenda being pushed that is anti-christian hmm. in our public schools and so if if a parent wants to you know teach their values to their own children they can't do that in the public okay. school system. Well, let, they got to pay Let's talk about that solution though. What do you, what do you what's your recommendation? Well, my my solution would be, you know, I I've talked to teachers that are ready to bail on the public system but they don't have anywhere to go because there's not a private system set up that they can go to. So I I've said I've said to a number of teachers I said, "Look, if we could find nine teachers, okay, so we got them teaching K through 8. That's nine teachers. If they would come out of the public system, and they would start their own corporation, and they, they could teach each up, each one of them could take a class, and they could run the administration for that between between all of them. Could they function on seventy percent of what we're currently spending in Oregon? We, we spend an average of ten thousand dollars per student to educate them. And I said, could you run a public system or a private system on seven thousand dollars a student? And they said, absolutely. And I said, well, so then the parents would be the parents would be involved in these schools and the parents expect the discipline to be in the school. The parents expect the kids to learn reading, writing, arithmetic, the normal basic stuff. They don't need to, and that their values are upheld in the okay. system, not, not, uh, not uh, diminished, okay. you know. Okay. I mean, you you want your children to learn the values that you want to teach them, not not something that your parents are are wrong and okay. and uh, distorting what what they're trying. But, to but teach that's you. your major issue on that yeah. particular piece. That, okay, we need we? we need to have we need to we have, have more a, discussion. We'll, yeah, I want exactly. to hear more on that. But I, I, I've got uh, I've got a a person, a gentleman, gentleman by the name of Sam Carpenter, who's going to be running for the U.S. Senate uh, here in the state of Oregon. And he's written a book called Work the System. And the reason why I was sort of exciting about him is that basically he just he has a he's a cure for, for businesses. Mm -hmm. And and he tells you how to do it. And as as a result of that, uh, we need we need more jobs. And when you talk about more jobs, that means you've got to have more employers. And uh, he basically takes a sick employer and get them back into functioning mm -hmm. in a more positive way. And I think I may have him on the phone. He's not here with us. We're going to have him probably in the future where you could actually see him. But um, but he's on the phone now, and uh, I'd like to introduce him. And maybe Sam might be able to give us a, just a little quick background of who he is about this work system aspect of it, about business and the employer aspect of it. And then at the same time, he can give us a little rationale as to why he's running for the U.S. Senate for the state from the state of Oregon. Sam, are you there? I am, Bruce. Okay, Thanks. let's turn it up a little bit for us. On turn the volume up a little bit on us. Okay, can you hear Sam? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Going on, Sam. Why don't you just let us know about um, in terms of what's your rationale for wanting to run for office for the U.S. Senate? I mean, you're a successful businessman, and uh, why why do you want to get 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 caught up in all of this situation? Going on. Well, it got pretty personal for me. I have about 40 people in one of my small businesses down here in Bend. Okay. And uh, I'm concerned about their futures. I'm concerned about the growth of the company. We're doing great. I run the company in a certain way. There's no reason we shouldn't be able to continue to grow. But on the front end, there's all kinds of rules and regulations. You know, the standard talking points, which are valid, about... Uh, the government getting in the way of everything and then and on the bottom line for a business owner it's you make some money and the government takes 60 percent of it so the problem you have here is that why do this as a business owner and i found that i found that it wasn't going to get fixed but maybe i had the resources and the right attitude maybe i could actually do something mm -hmm. we live in america and anybody can run for office and i have a pretty broad background of all kinds of uh, work and job creation and business creation, and I'm actually a pretty darn good candidate. And as senator here in Oregon, there's some things I can do, and it has to do with the forest, uh, cleaning up the forest, revitalizing our industry here in Oregon, our greatest natural resource, and uh, but especially revitalizing the small businesses that do right. produce seventy percent of all the all the jobs there are, uh, and they're killing us, man. They're killing us. Okay, Sam. 
Well, look, I tell you what, I want to give you that, at least that first entree. We're going to be, I want to spend more time with you and have, doing your, I know you've been knocking on these doors and whatever. Maybe we can get you to come down to the studio and spend a little bit more time with us. We really appreciate that. And, and I've got your book and I'm really excited about that because small business, as you, as you note, is the, um, is really the backbone of this country. And we need to generate jobs. And that's why I got so excited about the fact that you are running for running for the U.S. Senate. And maybe you might be able to educate those folks when you get down to, to Washington, but more specifically in Oregon and help us out. Again, thanks for being with us. Okay, bud? Okay, Bruce. Okay. Catch you later. Talk to you soon. Okay, fine. Okay, bye. Again, the, the same concept. The whole idea is that we've got to have responsible folks who happen to be running for office. But right. the fact of the matter is they bring something to the table that, in fact, would uh, uh, they've got the background and it, they're, they're, it's not an OJT type of a concept when you get into this kind of business. we got issues here, folks, yeah. and we gotta, we got to resolve some of these issues. Let's get back to the education of our youth and that's right there. You remember they, when, when, when Art ran the first time around against DeFazio, the, the second time, right? But, but, I don't know which time. But, but, but anyway, <laughs> Art ran. Art ran for ran for Congress. For losing uh, track. Yeah, he ran. He ran. He ran. He ran for for Congress. But education was a very key component that I was really excited about him, because the fact of the matter is he did homeschool for his kids, and they're all successful kids. Yeah. You know, PhDs, the whole nine yard. And in fact, they're a part and parcel of his business today. And he he's training them. And my point is that he got the background and whatever. He was very successful as compared to what we've got today in the system. So Art, would you mind spending us a little time no, on that whole education? To. Firstly, I, I started uh, life as a teacher at UC San Diego on the faculty. I used to teach in the university and I've taught a lot of uh, students in a lot of different ways. Homeschooling didn't exist when I was in public school uh, for the most part because we had the best schools in the world. And I got a great education in the public schools of Houston, Texas and that got me into Caltech and I wound up with a good education in science. It's been a wonderful life that the public mm -hmm. schools were instrumental in making possible. But those were locally controlled schools. Mm -hmm. They weren't controlled by the federal government. They weren't controlled by the state government. They were controlled by the peop by the parents, the teachers, mm -hmm. the communities, and even to a certain extent the students. And locally controlled schools were the tradition in America, mm -hmm. starting with the one-room schoolhouse. We've had the best schools in the world until very recent decades. And I'm a scientist, I'm an experimentalist. What has changed? What has changed is the authority over our schools has moved away from the localities and now rests in the federal government, the state government, and the education unions. Mm -hmm. And the unions are very powerful, so the politicians are afraid of them. Uh, we need to return to local control. Now, I've made a lot of statements about education and mm -hmm. things I've written over the years, and some schools in America are so bad that you just you can't stand it. What they're doing to the students, especially some of the minority communities, are just so bad you want to just get rid mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. But that's not true of all the schools in America. We have a lot of good teachers, yes, uh, but we've got a lot of bureaucrats that won't let them teach. Yeah. And as far as money is concerned, as he said, in Oregon, $10,000 per student, that's $300,000 per 30-student classroom. There's Jeez. no question that that, or even less than that, can run a good school. Uh, but the evidence is clear. Locally controlled schools provide terrific education. Mm -hmm. And of course, these mm -hmm. things he's taught concerned about the values of the community and the parents, locally controlled schools, uh, those values are present because they're controlled by mm -hmm. the families. In addition, it's even an economic matter. It used to be you move into a city, you want to know where the best school district is because you want to live there for your children. Mm -hmm. And moreover, Property values were higher. They, they was, the school districts would even compete with each other mm -hmm. because of what it meant economically mm -hmm. to, the, to their district. Mm -hmm. So we have very fine teachers, many of you know, millions of them. We have uh, a constitutional republic wherein our schools can thrive. Uh, we have a, a wonderful country, but our children are being shortchanged and worse mm -hmm. uh, because. Uh, well, unconstitutional involvement of the federal government, the Tenth Amendment, is very clear. It isn't a federal matter. But even in the states, uh, too much control, and in Oregon, too much control by the state. Take the resources we have, give them to the localities, mm -hmm. let the communities and the parents and the teachers and the students run those schools, and you'll be back right where you were 50 years ago with the best schools in the world. Well, tell me this. That, 
Good it on. has to be the policy. Uh, that's the, we know it works. Okay. And, how, and it's a wonderful how, thing. How did we get there? Well, we got to where we are well, now. Yes. How, how, I know how where we, we got to. We the, want to talk solutions, all right. Yeah, we have yeah. to talk some solutions. Let's talk to the, the solutions. Uh, we got to the greatest schools in the world simply starting with one-room schoolhouses and the parents, teachers, and communities right, right. building schools that gave their children the best possible mm -hmm, future. Mm -hmm, That's where we mm -hmm, got there. Mm -hmm. uh, we've gone astray as unions, state governments, federal governments, vast bureaucracies have seen this as an opportunity to gain power and money, and they have gradually taken over our schools. Mm -hmm. And this is why the quality has gone down. We're almost last in the developed world in quality of education mm -hmm. today, and we were not so long ago the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And of course, all these fixes. There's a homeschool movement. Two or three million people in home children in homeschools. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have homeschooled if the schools that I went to and that my wife went yeah, to existed. existed. Yeah. We would have put our children in the public, public schools because right, right. they were great. Right. So we have all these fixes the American mm -hmm. people are trying. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, in, in my race, the guy I run against votes for the unions all the time. Mm. They, they don't want to change the schools because mm. they've got power, they've got money out of this mm -hmm. thing, and they don't care about the students. Mm -hmm. So there's one solution. Go back to what has worked for America throughout most of its history. Locally controlled schools, and you'll have great schools, and all these social problems he's talking about go away. Mm -hmm. Or uh, stay with what you got, and those schools just keep going down, and it bodes very ill for our country because we're in competition with a lot of other countries mm -hmm. and they, today they have better schools right what do you got well solutions we're talking Talk solutions me. well Give right now we the the state of oregon the legislature fights over the school budget for a good chunk of of the time uh, before they fund it and a lot of times they fund the schools at it's such a late time in the session that that the school districts really don't even have, know how much money they're going to get until they're almost done with their done with their school year, which is which is ridiculous. So, um, I'm I'm interested in getting local control back into our local communities for schools. And one one of the one of the proposals that I'm bringing forward as governor is let's take 50 percent of the of what we currently take in in personal income taxes, let's just have 50% of what comes in for personal income tax, it should go directly back to the county, no strings attached, and let them use it and for- their respective area. Yeah, so so the, so the money, the state's getting the money, and that money right now is, is what they're turning around and sending back to the schools anyway. Let's just get the legislature totally out of that picture and just take 50% of the current uh, uh, personal income tax that comes in and just direct it back from the county direct the Department of of Revenue for the state of Oregon when they get that money in they just total they just take half of that and ship it right back to the county where the county commissioners it's in their budget and they fund their local schools with it yeah but what about is, is it the money I mean well it, 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 I mean, it is the, it is it where the yeah. money is is where it's controlled from yeah but, but let me give you an example okay my point is that here we are let's say in, in Multnomah County in the city of Portland right we got the largest school district in the state right here, right. Portland Public School. Yep. We got major failure right here. Yep. And it's not $10,000 per student. I think it's about $15,000 or $20,000 per student, mm -hmm. okay? okay? And so they're still failing. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do with that situation? Well, there again, I mean, if we could, if we could have the the cuz i imagine there's teachers in the portland public school system just like there are in in the school systems that that we're a part of that are frustrated with all of the the facts that everything's dictated from above they don't do lesson plans anymore where they plan their own it's pretty much dictated what they're going to teach how they're going to teach it and that they can't discipline the kids they can't touch the kids they can't even hug the kids anymore cuz that's you know that's that's considered uh you know, all of a sudden it goes to this this uh, thing where they're s somehow abusing the kid by giving him a hug. That's ridiculous, you know. So um, we need to get to the we need to get to where the we the the parents have a voucher in their hand that's worth seventy percent of whatever's spent in the school system. And you can do that school system by school system. In Portland, if if the, if what is actually going to the Portland school system, if it's more than ten thousand dollars per student then the parents would get 70% of whatever that number is in the so, so that it so that throughout the state it's it's it, it it is for the you know for that community it's relevant 
let let the teachers that are currently teaching let them form their own private co-ops and let seventy percent of that who's money. Gonna, who's going to be responsible to make sure that that kid gets gets the education, oh, that's, gets the money? That's, that, that's the problem. That's I'm the point, Bruce. The, that's what, the parents' now, responsibility. He, he suggested sending the money to the counties. Okay, send the money. I to wouldn't the send it to the counties. Yeah, that, okay. I'd send it to the school districts. To the school district. Take the money on a per capita basis, so everyone is treated equally. Okay. We don't have uh, this poor communities right, right. getting poor okay. education. Take all the money that you currently have, and he's trying to save money. Seventy percent would fund the schools oh, if yeah. you want to do that simultaneously. But anyway, take the money that's coming in the federal government, state government, local government, as an initial action. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it should all be taxed at the local mm -hmm. level. But uh, take that money, divide it on a per capita basis, and give it directly to the districts. And the school district decides on the whole thing, and then get out of the way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just get out of the way, and let the district make all its own rules, hire its own teachers. There'd be tremendous competition for the great teachers because mm -hmm. we have a lot of great teachers. Yeah, right, they right, could, right. they could, they could probably increase their incomes for the really good ones. Mm -hmm. There'd be competition, but basically, take the resources, get rid of the rules that the Fed and the states have been applying yeah, yeah. Have, have applied. Take the money on a per capita basis, give it right to the districts, school boards in those districts, and then just get out of the way. Get out of the way. And what would happen is the same thing that made our schools great in the first place, all those districts would compete with one another. Mm, mm. Some of them would have poorer schools. Many of them would have immediately better schools. But the competition would make the whole system rise, mm -hmm. just as it did before. Mm -hmm. And those districts, not only would they be run by the people most concerned about the individual students, the parents and community, but they would be competing with all those districts around them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that competition, plus the concern for the students, would make those, the quality of the schools go straight up. Okay. You have to get out of the way. Yeah, yeah, you can't say, well, we're going to have testing to see that you're all meeting a certain yeah, standard, yeah, because yeah. how is the standard derived? Mm -hmm. And we have to realize that if you did that with a thousand school districts, 50 of them might get worse temporarily. Mm -hmm. But when they saw what the better ones were doing, they'd rise. Competition. Competition is the That's basis the of our federal yeah. republic. Competition yeah. between 50 states. But but and but, competition can in between districts would fix the schools, and they'd be locally controlled. Well, and and and, and I guess we, we kind of have a little bit of a different. But you're the opinion. governor, now, right? We have a little bit and different. You're the superintendent of the, of the yeah, school I know. district. But 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 <laughs> well, but I would like to see I would like to see some some because because if you just have public system and they're just competing, you know, you got to be if you're in the district. Sometimes you don't have a control over where you live, and and you know you can only afford to live in a certain place, and and if you have only one choice of a school in that district, that's not a choice. Oh, so if, so if you got if you got that public school, and then you also have a private school where where the te where the the parent has a voucher that seventy percent of whatever is spent average for for that school district mm -hmm. if the parent has a 70 percent voucher they could take it and they could vote with that voucher and say i want my kid in this school no caps on how many kids can go to that school because that's what's happening now is the is the public the public system is controlled even the charter schools are the number is capped at what they can actually have even though they got capacity for more students to go there the school district caps that number because it, because it's controlled by the Oregon Education Association. That lobby controls how many, how, and, and, and as soon as they can get rid of that charter school, they'll do it because that charter school falls under the district. We have to have, we have to have competition. You have to have something outside of that, right? Like you have to have a but private think, school that's outside of that. But don't you think $15,000 or 20000 couldn't buy the best? Well, it, it should, but but see, what's going to happen is is the kid, the, the parent, and a half, the parent quick, right? votes with yeah. the money, and and they send their kid to that school, and and and, and they have a say over what happens in that school. If you want to keep, if you want to use your voucher, go to the public system, fine. But let's give them a choice. No, in I, every single I agree district. with them. In essence, I said there all the regulations that the state yeah. imposes should disappear, and a regulation that should disappear yeah. is that they tell you which school to go to. There you go. Mm -hmm. And since I said per capita, you would carry the money with you. So his proposal that you give it designated for the student mm -hmm. and he goes to the better school mm -hmm. is great. Yeah. I think you can have uh, the competition and still have public funding. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Well, we got about about a minute here. Now, any lasting remark? Governor, real quick, like, you got about 10 seconds, 10, 15 seconds, real quick, like. Well, I just... Uh, You'll be back. I, yeah, I I am... Uh, I'm, I'm out there with, with my resume, and I want to be on... Uh, I'm... I'm 
I'm asking for your vote. Okay, there you go. I'm, you know, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. All, right. All right, what do you think? I Real quick, right. Well, I'm running for federal office, so right. I shouldn't say anything about the schools. Okay. All right, right, right. right. the federal government. Right, 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 right. You're on the team. You're on the we need uh, we need responsible principal government in Washington, and we have to change a lot of them, and we need a change in District 4, and okay, I hope good. to make that change. Sounds great, folks. Well, I guess you can see we're going to have quite a time here. I'm going to, as one would say, we're going to continue this discussion. We're going to have these guys back here with us. We're going to really be looking at what can we do in Oregon. Again, thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time around. Have a good one.